I mean, you... start recording. I wonder why. Now, now it shows it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go. Go. Go ahead, Don. I apologize. Uh, it's okay. Hormone therapy for uh, a year and a half because it's considered high risk, and um, and also uh, radiation treatment. And uh, with the hormone ther ther hormone therapy, they also uh, put me on Zytiga at the same time. And that, that was uh, Schultz, the guy in Marina Del Rey's suggestion, which they agreed to here. I'm normally seen at the University of Colorado uh, Cancer Center, um, mostly by uh, this guy Crawford, who's the urologist. And... Um, been kind of percolating along probably the the newest thing which was a little disconcerting to me but um i had never been out to marina del rey to uh to see schultz and uh i did that uh about three months ago and uh and i have i'm on about every it varies but every three to six months psa it's been uh it's well post post prostatectomy it got down to 0 0.02 um, and then as soon as I started, uh, hormone therapy went to undetectable, um, it stayed at undetectable, um, took a long time to get any testosterone back. Um, after I stopped treatment, it was, and I don't remember, but almost a year and then still a pretty low level. Uh, but anyway, went out to, uh, Marina Del Rey. And, um, even though I had had a PSA test about a month before I went out there here in Colorado, which was again, less than uh, 0 0.01, he went ahead and wanted to do his own and it came back at 0 0.04. So then I had another, uh, another PSA here in Colorado. So obviously it was a different methodology, but another one here and it came after that about a month later, it came back at less than 0 0.01 so uh so he said uh, ignore it uh but we'll see and i've got my next psa here in colorado coming up in a couple of weeks so um been exercising a lot uh feel relatively good um testosterone's back a little bit but not very high i don't remember what the last reading was and uh you know that's about it i guess and and you're not um you're not on any meds now right i'm not on any meds uh well actually um um we're doing some um um metform metformin right the, yeah met, metformin um no not metformin the the thing for uh cholesterol metformin's ah. for uh blood sugar Statin. Yeah, a statin, a statin, sorry. Yeah, a statin, which, you know, I kind of asked him, don't you think it's a good idea? And he said, well, you know, your 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 blood work's okay, but it's not going to hurt. So went on that. And, you know, you know, I read all these things. And so I take a bunch of, you know, herbals and all this kind of stuff. And, and actually, I went to a... Um, uh, the, the urologist here suggested because I'm taking so much of this stuff, you know, which probably who knows, right? Who knows? So, um, but she suggested I go, they've got a, a alternative medicine practice where you see a, um, a, uh, pharmacist who will look at everything you're taking and see if there's anything that, that she, in this case would be nervous about mm -hmm. and there wasn't, but you know, I, I'm probably taking, you know, 20 pills a day. Mm -hmm. Hey, Don, so, do you know what your uh, dosage is on the statin? Yeah, it's only, uh, it's pretty low. I think it's five milligrams a day. Okay, thanks. Mm. Um, so, you know, with one, one thing that we've said a few times here, which was reiterated quite strongly um, at the UCSF research conference in November, is that if you're going to take any sort of supplement that is already in your body, so any sort of um, um, metal supplement like magnesium or, 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 or um, phosphorus or w whatever, 
um, or calcium, for example, uh, not a metal, but anything like that, that or any vitamin. It's really, you should know your starting level because there are some of these supplements that can be um, adverse if you already have enough in your body, like selenium, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I mean, I've got a note here that you were taking turmeric. And, um, you know, I know you had that whole issue over your lymphocyte count. I remember we talked about that when I when I had the meeting that I held from the airport that night. Um, yeah, the uh, and the lymphocyte uh, appears to have resolved. Okay. So uh, you know, but I'll still still keep checking it. Um, it actually was was still low here and then uh and then when we, when i went out to marina del rey um schultz tested it and it came back okay right so but i i'll continue to have that looked at but they were um you know i, I mean i went to a specialist here um whatever you call a um i think it was a hormone kind of doctor um and he said there's not much you can do about it and just watch it um, try not to get sick. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm still taking a bunch of stuff. Feel good. Um, I ran it all by Schultz. He didn't seem too concerned with the stuff. Taking a lot of turmeric. You know, a bunch of stuff. A lot of stuff. So. Okay. Okay. Well. We are delighted to hear that and, and, good. And 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 still uh let's see, uh so so almost two going on two years, not quite two years, um vegan. Um and uh you know, no not you know, so it's so you know so it's vegan plus no sugar, no artificial sweeteners, you know, pretty much whole foods. Right. So you know, I, I, I like challenges, you know, but I'm still not run. I'm still slow. I don't know. It drives me crazy. But anyway, that's it. Um, what did you what did you say your PSA was down to, Don? So the so the most recent one here in Colorado was less than point zero one. But in uh, in Marina del Rey, it was point zero four. Can't answer better than that. Right. You got you got to wonder whether he stacks those PSAs in the in Marina del Rey <laughs> to give a little extra treatment, eh, Don? Yeah, I don't know. He said he said he's seen. I don't know why they would have why he would be testing it, but he said he's seen women with a point zero four. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I just wonder with. I know that when I went pretty strictly vegetarian and and no dairy for a while and I was running um, a lot of mileage uh, I just I never really felt great because I and I felt like I was short of protein um, it, yeah I'm taking I'm taking a protein a vegan protein supplement I'm taking pre plenty of protein it, the, the issue probably is the combination of low testosterone plus yeah I'm also a little bit anemic, right? And uh, right. and I actually went back. Um, I had some old stuff from the '70s, and uh, and I was a little bit anemic then too. So I'm just on the bad side, I guess, of the profile or something. I don't know of right. the standard deviation. How long have you been? How long have you been off the hormone therapy? Um. So uh, let's see. So so uh, so 2004, 2005. Um, so it it probably lost effectiveness towards the end of 2006. So a little over a year, I would say. 2016. No, 16. Right, right, right. Okay. So it took it took you know almost a year to start registering testosterone right. again.
And and you were on for a year and a half, is that right? It is correct. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they say that to get back to normal, um, the rule of thumb is about twice the period that you were on it. And yeah, and I've also I, I've also seen a few things studies uh, that that say you never get back. Yeah. So it's some percentage, you know, it's like two thirds or seventy five percent of wherever you started at. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, you know, and, and that could also be with the low testosterone, that could also be a reason um, for uh, being a little anemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Let me, right. uh, let me open it up to every, anyone else who's on the call. Um, anyone else like to ask uh, questions to, um, to Don? How much, how much metformin are you taking, Don? How many milligrams a day? So, so, so it was my mistake. It was not metformin, um, not on that, because the blood sugar looks okay. It's just uh, a statin, simvastatin. Okay. okay. Um, which statin are you on? Simvastatin. So let me, let me just um, make a quick comment. The, the, the statin of choice, because it doesn't interfere with certain pathways, not that you're on any other drugs. Um, well, I should say not that you're on any other prostate cancer drugs, but the statins do tend to interfere with pathways. And the one that seems to be the preferred is Crestor or Rosuvastatin, R-O-S-U-V-A-S-T-A-T-I-N, Rosuvastatin. Now, um, that went generic during this past year. So in the formularies for um, a lot of the drug companies, in a lot of the insurance companies in 2018, it will be classified as a generic. Um, the benefit of Rosuvastatin is that uh, it doesn't interfere with grapefruit. So when you're on simvastatin, as you probably know, right. you can't eat grapefruit. Yep. If, like me, you happen to love grapefruit, then um, you might want to consider uh, switching from simvastatin to rosuvastatin, which is what I plan to do uh, when I refill my prescription. The other thing okay. with grapefruit uh, is that you're not supposed to be doing it with Viagra. Uh, could be. I don't know that one, but it could be. It's there every time you, you know, you every time I pick up my order, that's the one thing they say not to not to do. So, hey, has, do you eat do do you eat the grapefruit without a sweetener? I do. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I don't. I don't. I don't use it uh, personally. I don't use any sugar. I haven't for donkey's years. Um, but uh, yeah, and and also I I I would eat a grapefruit, um, just peel it and eat it that way, like an orange. So, uh, and I have access to a very uh, fecund grapefruit tree, so um, I'm eager to get off uh, simvastatin. Um, now. I, it, it has to do with CYP17. That is the enzyme that interfere, that grapefruit interferes with. And um, I, uh, I, I don't know about Viagra um, uh, art and- uh, I, can say, I can say more about that, Rick. There's, there's, a, there's a number of, drugs and Viagra is one of them that um, when you combine it with grapefruit it boosts the effect you know like by a factor of 10 it can be very dangerous with some drugs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you don't want your eyeballs to pop out don't be eating grapefruit while you're doing Viagra okay okay, okay. 
Um, yeah, I know that, um, you know, some, I, I don't know then if that's the, still that CYP 17 issue or if it's something else, but, um, you know, there are drugs like, like for example, Zytiga. If you take Zytiga with food, it becomes about four times as powerful. Um, with what, fruit? With food. With food. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, most people taking Zytiga will take it an hour and a half before, but the studies have shown that if you take it with food, you need about a quarter of the dose. Uh, because, because it's absorbed through the liver. So, um, any um, anyone else want to uh, talk to Dom before we move along? Okay. Oh, I think we have. Uh, I know two new callers: I, Tom Van Zant and uh, and somebody yeah. on the phone. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we got Dennis, who is probably on the phone and on the computer. Are you on the phone and the computer, Dennis? How, how did you guess that with me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so we got De we got Dennis. Um, Dennis, anything for you tonight that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, a minute or two. Okay. And Tom Van Zandt, anything for you that you'd like to talk about? Uh, no, I don't have any pressing issues. How about non-pressing issues? We may have time for that tonight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd like to get off loop run. How's that? <laughs> we can talk about that. There may be some people on from vacation on this floor. Oh, well, Len will be on, Len will be on when he finishes his food shopping. And... Um, and uh, when he comes on, we can definitely talk about Lupron Vacations because he's an expert on Lupron Vacations. Uh, one thing you want to talk about for me is uh, I mentioned to the oncologist about uh, radiation. And I, I've done it before, and they just tell me, oh, in your case, that's out. That's no good. You, know, you were talking about debulking tumors and whatnot. Yeah. And they just poo poo it when I mention it. Okay, well we we can we can we can talk about that too. Um, you know, this is a pretty new approach that we just see a lot of the centers of excellence taking and, and others. So we can we can talk about that a little bit. Um, Jay Kruckman, you're up. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to kind of update and ask a question or two. Um, brief, brief history again. Gone through prostatectomy, had radiation, and been on uh, Firmagon and Lupron for only a seven-month period because I did not like Lupron at all, and that's all in the last three years. Um, PSA is starting to go up again and uh, I've got with an oncologist uh, and uh, we decided to wait till after the holidays because of my reaction to the uh, Lupron. Get through them because I get nasty at times and other things, but um, I've had for the last probably six months or so, I thought it was a uh, pulled muscle and or things of that nature in my left groin, but it has not gone away. I've had a um, the bone scan uh, in the last couple of weeks that came back negative, and uh, I actually got an appointment tomorrow to see my urologist. Um, but it, it's just like, um, and excuse me for anybody who's, but it's like someone kicked me in the left nut and it just right. will not go away. Right. And I don't know if that's anybody else has experienced it, if it's totally unrelated, but uh, it's annoying right now. Very annoying. Hey, anybody want to address that? Can I, tell me again how long you've had it. About six months. Okay. And I start. I started. You know, started getting back in golf and things of that nature. And I thought oh, I pulled a groin muscle. Well, I've done that before, and uh, this does not feel like that anymore. 
and uh, sitting like I am now, it is, uh, it's very annoying. And, you know, on, on a pain threshold, it's a four or five, it's not going to kill me. But, and then sometimes the worst pain I have is I'm um, actually laying in bed and can't get it in a comfortable position. So I, again, I don't so, think it's a muscle related issue. So, so, you know, let me just say this is Don Price. Um, and, and it's probably not this, but, but I have also, and just recently, I shouldn't say that, um, three months ago, um, I did something and it was definitely a pain, but it wasn't in my groin, but it was, you know, closer to like an ab or something. And it took, you know, it's still there and it's taken three months and it hurts the most when I lie down on in, you know, back front, whatever. Uh, I, I finally, after couple of months went to see a physician about it and he gave me a muscle relaxer which uh, which certainly did help now you know only some x percent chance that it is and i know you said it doesn't feel like other groin pulls you've had before but i'm just saying that as i have noticed on myself that as i age things that i thought used to resolve in a month have taken significantly longer muscle pull type things to resolve so well, I understand that and appreciate that. I do have muscle relaxers. They don't they don't hit it at all. Um, so it's just been and I, I went and got checked uh, ten days ago, and he said it's not a hernia, and he gave me an antibiotic. He thought I had a uh, infection. Well, he said which is not uncommon if you've had a vasectomy or a prostatectomy. Um, but I'm done with that now and it has not solved anything. So I'm going back tomorrow morning to, uh, go to plan B or C or D or whatever. So, so. Jay, here's, I, I was going to say, I was going to ask you if you'd gotten checked for a hernia because it sounded like some sort of herniation, but I'm going to throw out one other thing. Um, because I know it's the, a similar sort of pain. Let me first ask you, has anybody... Um, any of the doctors that you've seen sat you down and sort of um, grabbed your, when you're seated, um, grab your bent knee and um, just move the femur around? No. Okay. Well, it's not really a urologist's area, and I don't know whether he's going to be sensitive enough to do it. I would suggest that that might be an issue because um, two years ago, I was having, um, it wasn't so much, well, it was groin pain. I was having groin pain. Um, and also I was having some pain in, um, in my iliotibio band. And it didn't go away for about three or four months. And so I had to make, um, I, I had a, a general checkup and I went in to see my doc and he sat me down and he moved my knee around and he could feel a lot of um, arthritis in my hip and so he sent me down for a um, x-ray and that's when I found out that I was actually bone on bone on my left hip although I really didn't have a lot of pain if any um, over the past two years, it's gotten progressively worse, especially in the last three months. So I'm getting a new hip on January the 10th. Um, but I just put it off and put it off. And I'm just wondering, since the symptoms sound a lot similar, you know, you've got that dull pain that doesn't go away. I'm wondering if it could be related to a hip issue. Well, I, uh, I, man, I, I think I appreciate that information, Rick. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I, 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 know, I know exactly what you're saying. My, 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 I had, and because of this, I had a bone scan, which I was kind of due for one anyway. And the only things they found were significant arthritis in both my shoulders, both my hips, and one of my knees. But I don't have any pain on the outside, which I assumed would signify hip problems. But on the maybe outside, I'm totally wrong. You, 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 when you say I, I don't have any pain on the outside, it's totally in the groin. Yeah, no, I mean this, this, I mean I, I am totally, but I mean I have no cartilage there at all, 
And it's been like that for a while and it's pretty pitted. I mean, I saw an x-ray. I mean, they can do it with just a regular x-ray. But um, if you've got some, if part of the, if, if you've got arthritis in your hips and part of the lining has gone, then it could easily be generating that, that sort of internal pain. Okay. Well, it's good and, information. Uh, you know, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. At the same time, um, if you've got to replace a joint, the hips, the best and the easiest one to do, way easier than knees, way easier than shoulders. And, you know, you're, you're, you're up and about within a few days and probably back to normal within 15 to 30 days. So I, I understand, I, I understand that as my father-in-law had another knee replaced and his mother was not, or his wife, not quite there. She said, well, can't you have a hip replaced instead? Cause it's easier. Yeah, it's so. way easier. <laughs> And I'm going to get mine done. I, I specifically sought out a surgeon who does uh, uses the anterior protocol because that severs the least amount of muscle. And people that I know have had hips have all said, if you have a choice, go for the anterior. So that's the way I'm going to do it. So um, okay. I, I, I don't know, but... I think that whoever diagnosed that arthritis in your hip, I would go back to that doctor and talk to them and say, do you think this could be related to my hip? Well, this actually, this actually came from the bone scan they did recently because of, because of this pain and my rising PSA. Okay. They wanted to make sure I was clean. Um, okay, well, but, it's not your urologist, you know, so, right. you know, either – Either go, either make an appointment with your PCP if you like them and they're good, or make an appointment directly with a um, with an orthopedic guy. And if you're going to do that, make sure it's somebody that does the um, anterior approach, just in case you have to get it done. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we handle everything here. With this, this is like. This is like those recording, medical calling shows where they call in with a question, you know. Okay, guys, come on, rescue me. What, what, talk to Jay. <laughs> Somebody else must have some ideas as what it, this could be other than a hip and a hernia. Well, <clears throat> this is Jake. The, the other thing that occurred to me is it, it's probably referred pain, um, and it could be from a kidney stone, especially if it changes when you change position. Um, you said it gets worse as you lay down, um, so it could be referred pain from a kidney stone. You might want to ask a urologist to check you for that. Yeah. Okay. Except that six months is a long time to have a, to have a stone issue, don't you think? Well, that's true. They do. They do move. Um, yeah. And they generally they they pass eventually. Yeah. And and uh, by the yeah. way, Jay, uh, you know on the on the lying down issue, I've had very little problem lying down as it so happens. I usually get relief, but a lot of people I've spoken to with hips do have issues when they're lying in bed and, and the doctors usually ask you, do you have issues lying in bed? So, you know. Well, I appreciate And again, I'm looking for uh, other medical help here, but um, it's just with the rising PSA, we did the bone scan, it was negative and we got this nagging aching and, and uh, I will move on to some other other type of treatments so let, let's go back to your um, let's go back to your, your your prostate cancer to our sweet spot here so the last record of a PSA I have for you was 0.37 is that right or is there something uh, like that? no that was that was back in September okay um, I went back in November, first uh, of November, and my PSA was a 0. 0.52. Okay. Um, um, at that point, um, my urologist was still not real. You know, just I'll take care of it, and and urged me to go back to the Casadex again, which I've never taken. Um, he had given me that when I was a 0. 0.37. Right. Um, that's where I went up uh, to Chicago and saw Dr. Uh, Morgans. Right. Um, 
after uh, I got this 0.52, I went, I found a urologist here in the Memphis area and we did PSA there and it came back at a 0.66. And again, we changed labs, so wasn't overly concerned about it. Um, he seemed like a, a really interested individual in, in the overall health and, and I told him my um, Lupron side effects and everything else and basically he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to get through the holidays before I start any treatments again. Mm -hmm. And he said, good, good answer. Mm -hmm. That's going to be his recommendation because um, it's still low enough, but it is definitely seems to be on the uh, yeah, increase. Going up. Now, wasn't, wasn't that guy, Brian Walker, didn't you tell us he was recommended by, uh, by Alicia Morgans? Well, uh, Dr. Walker was, uh, he's actually in Jackson, Tennessee, but again, he was not in my insurance network. Ah, so okay. I had to, had to go back outside and uh, find somebody who is at this point in time. Okay, so who's the doctor that you decided to, who you went to see? Um, it's a Dr. Weeks. Um, he is part of the West Cancer Center here in the Memphis area. Okay. Okay, and you feel that he has a fairly good handle on um, genito urinary um, cancers? From my initial meeting with him, yes. Um, I mean, they, I, I called them, or let me say, they called me looking for an appointment, and uh, he was leaving the country actually for a couple of weeks, and they squeezed me in that same day mm -hmm. and everything else. So, um, I, right now, I feel comfortable. We have only had one short meeting with him. Okay. Um, well, again, you know, you can run him, run him past uh, Alicia Morgan. Just tell him that the that, that that Walker wasn't in your um, network, but you've seen weeks because, you know, with her having worked at Vanderbilt, she probably knows a lot of these people. Yes. So. And you know, she's probably gotten referrals from them over time, for, you know, when, when they've gotten more complicated cases. Right. right now I have an appointment set up for, I think it's January 8th or so um, with, with him to get another PSA done and figure out if we need to start treatments. Now, one thing that, that occurred to me is that if you're having um, mood issues, as a result of the LHRHJ, and, and it's not uncommon. It really isn't. And, you know, you, you may have heard me say, others have definitely heard me say, D don't beat up on yourself because when you take the testosterone out of your body, it has significant impact on several of your brain chemicals. Um, there are some doctors that hold to that theory and agree, and there are others who don't. I was just happened socially, I happened to be with um, last Friday night with a psychiatrist and her partner, her boyfriend, who's a very, very close friend of mine. Uh, he's a family doc. And we were actually talking about this and she absolutely agrees that um, when you have no testosterone and, and, and you know, no androgens, estrogen, et cetera, it compromises your brain chemistry. And yet I have spoken to other doctors who don't hold to that. So uh, one of the things that you might want to discuss with weeks when you go back is um, to get a consult with a psychiatrist um, to uh, help you potentially balance out if you go back on an ADT drug. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to look at this as, as if it's a, I mean, it is a medical issue. This isn't a social issue. Right. And, 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 and if your mood, you know, if your mood becomes more aggressive when you take the testosterone out of your body, it's because you're lacking, it's, you're not producing a chemical you were producing earlier on. And the experts in that are the psychiatrists, that's what they do. 
and they may be able to say, yeah, well, well, let's look, you know, why don't you try this? Because maybe it's going to be a way to help you tolerate the LHRH drug, which is really the building block for the treatment. Right. So no, I, I understand and appreciate it a whole lot better after being off of it because I've been off now for about 15 months. Right. So. Right. Right. And I mean, and, you know, if you're pretty balanced when you're off of it, look, if you're not balanced when you're off of it, you've got an issue, you've got to address that issue. But if if you are um, balanced when you're off of it, but you go on it and it, and it makes you imbalanced, then maybe there's a drug that they can give you that will help you correct that imbalance. Right. Okay. So I really um, think that should be raised with, with your, now somebody like Morgan's is going to be very empathetic to that because she um, is very interested in how the um, ADT affects cognition and, and other, uh, and mood. It's one of the areas of her study. So again, you might want to access her on that. Send her a note and say, look, you know, I'm thinking of going back on, but I've, I had some real issues with mood swings and aggression. Any thoughts? Any any thoughts on maybe you know drugs or ways that I could balance that out? Because she may she may have some access to knowledge that somebody like Weeks wouldn't have because it's so specialized. Right. Okay. That's very good. Okay. Um, anyone else want to um, want to talk to Jay? Hey, Jay, this is Dennis Correa. Uh, yes, I can attest to the uh, issue with the ADT and uh, the, the moodiness. Mine comes on as an emotional uh, type of a feeling. And with there's very little, uh, I don't really know what triggers it. I don't, it doesn't happen very often. But I've, I've kind of described it as a uh, a young 13-year-old girl just kind of breaking up with her first true love. And, um, you know, there's things like, uh, we'll be at church or something, and I'll, uh, you know, one of the songs we'll be singing would be something my mother used to sing. And then, you know, all of a sudden, I can't, I can't sing or talk or anything. It just kind of emotionally overwhelms me. But it goes away. And uh, just this, this week here, another emotional thing was my birthday. And uh, of course, you know, my, my both daughters are remote from where I live and I always get a card and I got a card from both of them and one called and I was waiting for a call from the other one the rest of the evening and, and I never got the call. So lo and behold, here comes the waterfall. You know, I just start, <laughs> what's going on? I, you know, I understand that reason. It's just, it's just reasonable something that she's busy or she, you know, uh, but you know, you just kind of get that feeling, and and it's overwhelming. But again, it it goes away fairly quickly. So I, at this point in time, it's, I just attribute all this to uh, you know another side effect that I can I can live with, uh, like the hot flashes and that type of thing. Well, I, I, go ahead, Jay. No, I, I was going to say, I, yeah, I understand that, and for whatever reasons, I've at, at times been very emotional. It got worse or more more advanced or whatever um, when I was on the ADT, but I can handle that par portion of it and the hot flashes weren't an issue. I mean, they were, but yeah, I could handle that. Um, I got angry at times and that, that was the part that's, I did not, obviously did not like and uh, doing things that, yeah. Yeah, I've had a temper before, but uh, this, this was a weirder, you know, thing not, not physical but just a uh, lashing out at things that shouldn't be that way right um so i i want i do want to address that and, and maybe we should you know i'd like to bring other people into this discussion um about the emotional effect the emotional impact of of, of being on an lhrh drug an androgen deprivation drug but i i want to share with you my own experience, um, both Jay and Dennis. So 
Um, I've been on a um, SNRI antidepressant since 2000. I tried one in the 80s, 80, mid 80s, and uh, you know at that time the level of the drugs, the, the the level of development of the drugs was 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 pretty crude, and it made me feel like I was on another planet, and I, and I stopped taking it. Um, we I have. I'm pretty sure a um, a genetic deficiency, um, which I just found out talking to this psychiatrist, may be related to some mutation in a gene that um, processes folic acid. It, it's it's pretty common. It's common in about 70% of people that have chronic depression. And um, so I was familiar with depression. Um, very familiar with depression. And so when I was on the ADT and, and I became significantly depressed, it didn't scare me any. You know, a lot of times it scares men because they've never known depression before. And when you've never known it and it suddenly hits you, you, you wonder what the heck is going on. Um, and what I did, I, I talked to my PCP about it and he said, well, just try doubling your meds, which I did. And it worked. And then I would go back to a lesser dose when, when, when I felt fine. So I was just balancing myself. Now, interestingly enough, the drug that I take, which I do really well on, I know other people, they find this particular drug to be really numbing and they cannot tolerate it. Um, so, you know, everybody's different. But the point is that if you are having any type of emotional issue when you're on ADT, please don't hesitate to consult with your doctor and to ask for a cons consult with a psychiatrist because there's so much that we can do today. And, so much, and, and, and a lot of what you're feeling is a result of having little or no testosterone unless you've got an underlying problem like I had or have which I recognize and then I, you know, I just have to balance myself out. But, but, you know, for people like Dennis, for Jay, if he goes back on the drug, um, there's no shame in seeing a psychiatrist, particularly when this is not a social issue. This is a medical, this is a medical, a physiological issue. Let, 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 let me, let me throw this one out. Um, be, just before I do that, I want to welcome Len who's just joined us. Hello, Len. Hi, Rick. Hi, everybody. And Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Got caught in heavy traffic. That's okay. And you were definitely on the email list. So I just want to tell you. Oh, uh, I, okay. that, I, sent that, you I sent that note to Jake. I meant to send it to you. Sorry, Jake. But you were definitely on the email list. We'll, we'll talk after. And somebody joined us on the telephone. Who is that? This is Sylvester. Happy Hello, holidays. Sylvester. Too. Okay. Apologize uh, for being late. No problem. So let let me let me throw this out to other people that are on um, have have spent a lot of time on on an LHRH drug and you know let's talk a little bit about how it affects your emotions if at all. Uh, <clears throat> This, okay, this is Jake. If I can, if I can talk, please. Um, I was on an antidepressant before, but then I stopped taking it. And then when, once I was on the once I was on the LHRH, I started getting kind of snippy with my wife. I didn't even realize it. She told me that that you know, please go back on the antidepressant. I wasn't even aware that I was you know that I needed something. So I do take it. It, it. it helps keep me balanced, I guess, is, is a better term than anything else. Um, so, you know, like Rick says, he knew when he was not he was not right. But I didn't even realize it. It's my wife is the one that told me and she says, please, please, please ask your doctor to give you put you back on it again. And uh, so it does work. It does help. What are you taking? What What drug are you on? Um, the the brand name is Remeron, but I, it's the, the generic name is Mirtazapine, mm -hmm. M-I-R-T-A-Z-A-P-I-N-E. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, there are and so many of these drugs today that there are, yeah. they can really be tailored to your particular issues. This is why I really encourage 
all of you that haven't, you know, you feel that you're not balanced on the LHRH to talk to a good doctor, a psychiatrist, or possibly your PCP. But uh, sorry, Jake, go ahead. That's all right. And I was just going to just say that you, you guys might find this funny, but as far as the crying part goes, um, I'll cry during, believe it or not, a John Wayne movie. <laughs> of, of, of all the movies in the world to lad to cry over, you know, when they when they do the singing, and you know, back in the forties and fifties, I'll start crying for no reason. Or not, not try, cry, cry, but I get tears in my eyes. So, and that's just the, you know, that's the the uh, the LHRH at work also. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anybody else want to chip in on this one? I mean, you know, people that have been in a long time, like Paul Frieda or, or, or you know, Len has been on and off for, 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 for a long time. Tom Van Zandt. I mean, have you um, have you had issues with 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 your emotions? Do you feel when you've been on an LHRH drug? Oh, yeah, I think I do. I get blasted by hot flashes that just drive you crazy. And it, make, it makes you snap. Uh, uh, it makes you very impatient with other people because while they're living a normal life, you're getting blasted by these hot flashes. And I mean, these hot flashes to me are much more than just feeling warm. It's like you're trying to concentrate and do something and it takes complete control of your body and mind and you can't focus on anything else. And it's, it's you just get disgusted and sick of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, for me, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of emotional response, but, but it's um, really upset my life, and that is that I put on a lot of weight because of the metabolism thing, and then, and um, I, I can complicate things. I've had back problems, so I can't get very, almost no exercise, and um, and I've got now a peripheral edema, and I can't get into my shoes. So, it's, it's so that of course it depresses me, but it's not sort of a thing that that depresses me, um, you know, all the time. It's just the results of the whole thing have, um, you know, really interfered with my life quite a bit. The hot flashes I take care of with uh, putting fans wherever I sit. And, um, and you know, other than that, um, you know, so I, I, if, if I didn't have to be on Lupron, I, I, I would prefer not to be on it, but I don't really have much choice. Uh, let, let me just come back to Tom a second, um, and 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 also I want to, to comment on on what Paul said. But Tom, with the hot flashes, I don't want to talk about that right now. We can talk about it later. I want to stick on emotions. But um, do check into acupuncture because a lot of men have gotten good responses off of acupuncture. Um, the problem is you've got to top it up every two to three weeks, but you might find it's going to give you some relief. And, um, you know, and, and the points are known. Um, the, a good acupuncturist knows those points for the hot flashes. So um, you, you, might, you might want to deal with that. But, you know, what I want to say is don't, don't use other symptoms as excuses. Because if you're feeling depressed, it, it, it's likely that it's actually a direct result of the of the LHRH it's not uncommon it's very in fact I would say it's very common and that's why I just really feel that if you if you feel that depression at any point in time or that anger or you're 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 very easy to anger you fly off the handle talk to the dark because because you don't need to be that way and there are things they can do for you and it's coming, it's coming from the LHRH. I'm not saying the hot flushes don't aggravate it or the, weight lo or the weight gain doesn't aggravate it, but don't discount the fact that this drug causes depression. Rick, I'd like to add on to your comment about acupuncture. I just uh, heard stories in my local uh, prostate cancer support group here in Danbury, Connecticut, of uh, three guys who went for acupuncture for various reasons, 
peripheral neuropathy, hot flashes, um, other points of pain, and they all swear by the treatment they got. They got relief. And I was really amazed hearing that acupuncture was effective for peripheral neuropathy because up till now, I had always thought that it was pretty much intractable and that nothing really worked well. So that's, that's a suggestion. And, and, anyone who might want to and what, what, what are your thoughts on the emotional issue with, with LHRH? Yeah, I, um, I have had, uh, as you know, Rick, and anyone else who knows me, I'm really laid back, easygoing. I don't, I'm not quick to anger. However, when I was on the um, hormone therapy, I'm currently off at the moment, um, there were times when I would fly off into a rage. Uh, fortunately, those times were when I was by myself, you know, and I would just let fling a right. screw of uh, obscenities screaming at the top of my lungs, uh, just me there. And, and that kind of relieved the, uh, the rage that I was feeling for, for whatever reason that it was uh, causing it. Um, but my biggest problem when I was on uh, hormone therapy was fatigue, mm -hmm. uh, not so much the hot flashes. Uh, and I think even the fact that I had the fatigue, then it prevented me from doing the things I wanted to do uh, was part of that anger that I felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I but think I never, I never felt I needed to go on an antidepressant. Well, you know, I what I want is. What I want to encourage all of you is, you know, we, we make value judgments about being on an antidepressant. And, and that's just because of the way that we're, we've been raised and um, acculturated. Uh, and certainly coming from the UK, um, you know, people never would never even talk about mental illness. They would never acknowledge mental illness. I mean, I have a mother who had 27 shock treatments, and people would never say, oh, your mother's depressed. They say, oh, you know, she's poorly. Your mother's poorly again. Yeah, my mother's poorly. They can't say it. Whereas at least in this country for years, certainly as long as I've been living here, which is 40 years, you know, people do see therapists, and it is acceptable and more acceptable to talk about a therapist. So. It's acceptable to take an antidepressant and don't make value judgments. And if you think that you're doing something that you don't usually do that is mood related, whether it's flying off the handle when no one's around, um, whether it's, you know, shedding a tear, which you usually don't do, then it's worth talking to the doc about, about getting some medication to see if you can deal with it. because. It's the, it's the lack of testosterone that is contributing significantly to this. And there's no shame in having heart flashes, and there's no shame in having fatigue, and you'll do whatever you have to do to deal with those issues. So why not do whatever you have to do to deal with your mood issues? Um, and if we can encourage you all through these calls to be willing to address it, it's a hurdle. You know, to step across that threshold and talk to a PCP or talk to a consulting psychiatrist about this and asking for something to help you is a big hurdle. It's not easy to do. But I just want to make it, I want to encourage you to try and make it easier because you'll feel better for it. And that's the bottom line. Well, as you said, Rick, it's 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 a medical issue. It's usually a, a lot of depression is 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 a, a chemical imbalance. Right. Um. You know, we you can get depressed temporarily over the loss of a loved one or things not going well at work or whatever. But a lot of times, chronic depression is due to a chemical imbalance. Um. I forget the name of the the the, the uh, epinephrine or no no that's not the one. Endorphin. Endorphin. Endorphins. No, that's the one that makes you feel good. Um, You're thinking norepinephrine, uh, Jake. Maybe that's it, yeah. yeah. 
but there's a balance. Serotonin. Serotonin is serotonin, the one. Right. Yeah, serotonin too. <laughs> yeah. So taking a pill, like that's why I said before, it, it kind of balances you out. It doesn't, it's not an upper or a downer. It just, it just kind of balances you out and levels you. So. Right. 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 Um, okay. Um, so I, would anyone else like to add to this before we move on to another discussion? Paul's <laughs> making <laughs> Paul's making a uh, smoothie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably with a lot of rum in it. <laughs> um, okay. Um, either that or Tom Van Zandt's dog is on the treadmill again. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> let's, let's move on to Art. Um, Art, talk to us about this decision that you're, that you're faced with and how can we help you to think through it? All right, it's got the microphone on now. Okay. Um, well, I've been on the uh, Glupron and Casadex for about two months now. <clears throat> and I was <clears throat> offered, before I started that even, I was, I was offered uh, um, the choice between uh, Zytiga and Taxotere to go with a Lupron as opposed to Casadex. <clears throat> and I've been punting on that decision. I've, you know, I've been researching my ass off. Seems like it just gets more complicated. And um, my oncologist is really no help whatsoever. I've pretty much had it with her. Um, one of the things, let's see. Well, I'll throw out <clears throat> the topics on this decision-making process when I was kind of general. Um, seems to me from what I've read that um, there's only two things that we really know about ADT, Lupron, et cetera, is, is that one is that it works, but not for long. And the other is that what you're left with when it stops working is worse than what you had with um, when you started. And that presumably is the reason why um, either of my two choices are less effective after rebound than they are before or during. Um, but that, you know, that all that does is really raise the question of what about all the rest of the options, right? They're probably going to be more effective when you're hormone sensitive than they're going to be when you're castrate resistant. Um, a lot of, a lot of people out there that seem to think that and I, <clears throat> without being able to cite them, I, you know, I think that there are a lot of studies going on right now, um, where they're trying to get this both my question answered and, and the question of um, what about moving other drugs forward and what about uh, using them in concert with each other at the beginning? Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of a cocktail um, carpet bombing approach. Mm -hmm. I, I'm no expert on, on the whole HIV history, but I, if I have this right, um, it was the cocktail that saved the day. And that um, <clears throat> uh, so that's 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 one that's one part of the question. I mean, it, it, it almost seems to me like we had it backwards. If there's a drug that we know um, is going to is going to make your cancer harder to deal with, shouldn't that come at the end and not at the beginning of the whole lineup of drugs? Um, of course, if you know, nothing else has been FDA approved, so it's, um, at least in the eyes of my oncologist, she's not interested in having that discussion. Um, another part of the discussion has to do with antiandrogens, and um, there's information out there that says that. Well, here, I'll quote. Differential androgen deprivation therapies with antiandrogens Casadex or MDV 3100, that's enzalutamide, 
catches exoenzalutamide versus antiandrogen receptor AFC J9R. That's called preamble. Um, those therapies lead to promotion versus suppression of prostate cancer metastasis. Has anybody else heard that? Well, the cash is that as you noted earlier, you know, it's yeah. really well known that when you repress the androgen pathways, you begin to de-repress or activate alternative pathways for the cancer to spread and uh, proliferate. So it's kind of a catch-22. I mean, the androgens, we know they work, so we use them. And yet, as you said, when it's all over, you're, you're in a worse position than you were before. The, but, yeah, that, that was my first point that you're addressing. Thank you. And the second point, though, is about the antiandrogens um, that will lower your PSA and shrink your tumors at the same time that they're putting more cancer cells into your bloodstream. This also came up with articles about CTC, the circulating uh, tumor cell uh, tests. And, um, and this is true. It's true for some men but not for all men. And the, you know, the question is, how do, you, how do you figure out which group you're in? You know, which leads into the question of genetic and other types of testing. Um, let's see. I'm, by the way, one of my symptoms, I've, I've been doing uh, ADT for about two months now, and, and probably the, the thing I hate the most is kind of taking a hit to my cognitive functioning. Mm -hmm. Hard for me to stay focused, concentrate. It's hard for me to follow through, you know, line of thought. Memory is not so great. Doesn't make the research any easier, and it really did not help with my last conversation I was having with my oncologist. Um, so excuse me if I don't follow follow my own line of thinking here very very carefully. Um, I also, where are we here? Uh, okay, this is, this is from a guy named Isan Chen, who's in San Diego and is also uh, involved in, in companies producing um, cancer drugs. He said that if your prostate cancer has an ARV7, that's the androgen receptor variant 7, it may not respond well to Zytiga. Right. In this case, Taxotere may be a better option. Um, so, so that's, let, let me address a few of these issues. Um, let's start with the ARV7. We've known about the ARV7 variant for quite a long time. Uh, um, the, uh, if you are ARV7 positive, it's going to mean that you will, um, it, you are not likely to respond to um, either Zytiga or enzalutamide. Uh, most, what, about, what about Lupron and Castrodex? Uh, yes, no problem. You will respond to Lupron, you will respond to Casodex. Okay. Um, but you won't respond to the those two second-line antiandrogens. Now, the new antiandrogen that, uh, that Johnson, that Jackson is just about to bring out, I think is, uh, oh, is it, is it ORN501? I'm trying to remember what it's called. Oh, apalutamide. Apalutamide, right. I think it's, I think that's ARN501. Is supposedly going to address those men who are ARV7 positive. However, having said all of that, and, and by the way, we have a test for ARV7. Um, I can send you the requisition order. You can you can ask to be tested for it before you get put on the drug. It's it's probably in the best interests of the prescribing. Um, uh, if it's an HMO, the prescribing HMO, because the test is a lot cheaper than one month's supply of the drugs. Uh, having said that, when I was at the conference in. Um, at UCSF, Chuck Ryan said to me, we're now starting to believe that ARV7 is nowhere near as good an indicator as we thought it was. 
So I don't exactly know what that means. He didn't elaborate. It was sort of a comment because I was talking to him about um, how I felt that the trial, the tele, tele uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the the um, Pfizer's uh, Park inhibitor, telezumimab. I can't. I, I, I've lost it. Telezaparib. Telezaparib. Um, that they were not testing for ARV7 when they should have been. And he said to me, well, we, we're not so sure how good a test that is now. And I can't tell you more than that. It would take some research. Um, I do know that Genomic Health, which who make Oncotype DX, are about to introduce a commercial ARV7 test. And uh, that will be available, I think, in January or February, and it'll be a lot less expensive than the Johns Hopkins test. So we know mm -hmm. quite a bit about ARV7. But, okay. I, but I want to come back to a couple of things. Can you just turn your volume down just a tad because we're getting getting some feedback off of your, off your mic? Um, yeah, I want to come back to a couple of things. One, I, I really would like Len to address this issue of what do you do when you find out that you, 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 you're going to embark on hormone therapy? What do you choose? I mean, the name of the game is to make each phase of each treatment last as long as you possibly can. Because nobody's going to argue with you that the treatments don't last forever and that some of the treatments may have adverse impacts when they stop working. Um, but we don't have better treatments. And there are no, I mean, certainly, I mean, unless you want to start talking about some of the alternative treatments that are out there, which I, I don't think have been proven in any way, shape, or form. We have to go with what we know, and we have to stretch it out as long as possible. And there are a lot of men who stretch out hormone therapy for years and years and years. There are other men who sadly have a different type of prostate cancer who maybe don't last even a year. And we've known them. They've been on our group, sadly. But until you start working with the, with, with the existing treatments, you don't know how long they're going to last. And to avoid a treatment because you don't think it's going to last that long, um, to me, I, I, would not, I would not justify not doing a treatment for that reason. Um, yeah, that's so, not what I'm talking about, though, Rick. I, I think that what you're, I understand what you're saying. But if I'm hearing you right. I think that what you're saying is at odds for the results of the stampede and latitude. You know, that was what that was the idea, right? You do ADT, it doesn't work, and then you do taxotere or, or some chemo uh, or Zytiga or one of the you know one of the one of the new uh, you know, the androgens. But you know, we just found out that you'll live longer if you don't wait if you do it together at the beginning. So if it's true, if it's true for those drugs, it might also be true for others. So if you could design your treatment what would it be well let's see i'm just you know, let me find the drug list <laughs> um well for starters I'd be, I'd be tempted to do to add take both of those choices and add them to lupron do them together so i take an taxotere with the lupron since we already know that either one of those up front works better than than they do at the end. Um, hmm, other things, you know, I've got, I've got bone metastases and at least the last time anybody looked, that's all it was. It wasn't soft tissue, but <clears throat> I want to know that. I want to know more about that. Um, there's um, targeted radiation um, therapy that's, that looks to be especially effective for bone metastases. Um, and 
I know, you know, one of them is FDA approved already. That's, uh, there's a Zofigo Radium 223. Um, but, the, you know, there's another, well, let's call it the next generation of targeted alpha radiation therapy um, that's been in study and it's been, it's been used uh, in Germany under compassionate care. Um, and it goes in, you know, it takes, it takes the radioactive isotope in through the AR receptor. So it's only going into the, to your cancer cells. And it's not going after bone growth in general or calcium in general. Well, that's not exactly right. It's actually sensitized with something called prostate specific membrane antigen, PSMA. Yes. Right. And and it is available in this country. I mean, it's been available in Germany. It's been available in Australia. Uh, we know people. We've had people who have used it. We've got one person right now who's considering a trial here in the U.S. with lutetium, but it's a private trial. Um, and the doctors that are offering the trial, it's about seven thousand dollars an application at this point. So it's pretty expensive, but it's there. But my point to you is, I mean, what, what is your, all of these things we know about, we're aware of all of these drugs. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking that you'd like to do everything at one go, all at the beginning? Um, I don't know enough about the toxicity uh, and, the, and the overlaps to be convinced of that, but, um, but I'd like to find out more about it. Okay. So, so let, 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 let me address that, and then I really, want, I, really want, I really want Len to talk about this a little bit, but I know he's given this a lot of thought. But um, the problem that we're faced with when we do too much up front is that it's possible that it morphs the cancer more quickly. We know the cancer changes. We know this. We know that men who have adenocarcinoma, which is hormone sensitive um, prostate cancer, clearly have hormone print sensitive prostate cancer early in the um, disease path. As they progress, the hormone therapy becomes, the hormone sensitivity becomes less and less and the cancer changes in the way that it looks and it becomes much more like small cell and neuroendocrine cancer, which is untreatable. And the risk that has always been suggested by centers of excellence, people at Memorial Sloan Kettering and, and, and uh, UCSF and Hopkins and Dana Farber and MD Anderson, etc., is that if you throw too much of these cancers at this, this type of prostate cancer too quickly, it's going to morph much quicker. And then we don't know what to do with it. So the trade off is yeah, I mean, throw everything at it, but if we recognize that nothing's going to cure it, which unfortunately is the situation. We don't think there's anything that's going to cure it. What we want to do is manage it for the longest time so you die from something else. What we don't want to do is encourage it to change into a different type of cancer that we don't have a treatment for. Um, yeah, I think we're repeating ourselves and talking past each other a little bit. I take your point, but I do think that that's at odds with Stampede and the other trials. I don't, I, I don't necessarily agree with you. I hear what you're saying. I, I hear exactly what you're saying, and it's something that we have to wrestle with. Yes, we're, we're now looking at the benefit of earlier treatment with chemotherapy, earlier treatment with, with second-line antiandrogens. But the benefit from the second-line antiandrogens is still pretty small. It's not from the chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is a different type of treatment. We've never used chemotherapy in prostate cancer early in the game. In other cancers, they, they, they definitely do. In ovarian, which is a hormone cancer, they do. In breast, which is a hormone cancer, they do. It's not surprising to me that early chemotherapy has a very significant impact. And if we talk about uh, somebody like 
Dom, Dom Marese, God rest his soul, our dear buddy. He was in a trial back in 2005 with early chemo. And he had aggressive disease and he lasted more than 10 years after that. And I still think to this day, we don't know for sure, but maybe we were when his trial results are published, that that early chemo made a difference for somebody like him. I wanted chemo when I first was diagnosed, but they wouldn't give it to me. Now, what about adding uh, second line antiandrogens up front? Yeah, they make a difference. They do make a difference. What we don't know at this point in time is when they wear off, is the is the treatment, is the cancer less treatable? We don't know that. And Pete didn't address that. Latitude, did, sorry, Latitude didn't address that. We don't know. So I, I don't think we're talking past each other. I mean, we understand all these issues. Len, let, 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 let me throw it to you because you're somebody who didn't want to do treatment and we, we, we had to talk you into a lot of you. And these were the issues you were wrestling with. Exactly. And uh, I probably can't add much to what you've already said, Rick. I agree completely with everything you've said. Um, some other considerations, however, are uh, nearly every treatment that we use has bone marrow suppression as a side effect. I would be concerned about using Taxotere and Zytiga or Taxotere and Enzalutamide and God knows what else together because then you get super bone marrow suppression. Uh, you, you don't want to weaken your immune system, which with a number of people, Dom Marese for one, who found himself disqualified for a number of clinical trials uh, because his uh, bone marrow was too uh, suppressed. His platelet count was very low. Um, another issue is insurance. Uh, right now, I doubt that uh, enzalutamide or uh, Zytiga will be paid for by insurance companies up front before you use anything else because up till now, it's only been used uh, after the other, after you become castrate resistant, after Lupron has failed, uh, possibly even after Casadex has failed. Uh, the trial that showed a survival advantage to uh, Zytiga, uh, comparing it to, uh, and I think enzalutamide as well, comparing it to uh, Casadex, um, didn't take into consideration the fact that those drugs are used sequentially. Uh, they're not used simultaneously. So suppose you got a couple of years out of Pasadex and then you started uh, Zytiga. Would you have done better than if you used Zytiga right up front and didn't use Casadex? Who knows? They didn't really look at that in the trials. Yeah, and I just want to add one thing there. Um, Jerry Carniglia, God rest his soul, was on a trial at UCSF where they were giving him Zofigo at the same time as chemotherapy. And um, he had bad myelosuppression, su suppression of the bone marrow, and he had to, and he came off, he came off the Zofigo. So, you know, there, we, we, have to, we have to be sensitive to some of these side effects. And, you know, I, 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 to get back to your decision, I think if it were me, just based on the, um, based on the trials, uh, Uncharted and Stampede, uh, we we know that the chemotherapy has a very significant effect, probably the most significant effect of anything. And um, so, you know, why not kick off with the chemotherapy? It's the low hanging fruit, and then deal with that. 
see how you're doing and see what where that takes your see how much it suppresses your 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 PSA uh, see how much it suppresses your alkaline phosphatase keep a close eye on it with your um, um, scans and then decide when you when you've been through six treatments which is going to take you out for you know at least um six threes are 18 you know it's 18 weeks so so figure over and a half five months then start looking at the second line antiandrogens at that point in time and i think mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got a lot more chance of getting um your zytiga or enzalutamide approved after you've done chemo based on these based on these trials um okay yes i think that's a good idea um i'm with kaiser i've got the senior advantage i think i'm going to be switching but um they are offering Zytiga up front um my my thought is that it's um you know it's the hormone sensitive versus castrate resistant uh, threshold that makes the difference in with the effectiveness of the other drugs. And so if there's a way to, um, I feel, you know, once I feel like once I hit castrate resistance, I will have missed the opportunity to use uh, effectively some of these other drugs. But where so what about you know stretching from? out? Where are you getting that from? Uh, getting it from Stampede, and I'm getting it from Latitude, and I think I'm getting it from Chartered. I can't remember the difference between the three. I mean, one of the links you had on um, last week sent us to uh, Alicia Morgans. We were just talking about her. Right. Yeah, well, in, in that article, I think it, it might have been a video or an article. She she addresses all of this, and, um, and I think it, I think I'm more or less paraphrasing her when I, as I've been talking. What about um, doing ABT for a while before uh, it rebounds, going off of it, and then trying one of these other drugs, and then going back onto it, and then and going off of it, and trying another drug, while I'm still hormone sensitive. You think about that. So, uh, so whilst you're still hormone sensitive, going off the LHRH and trying a um, and trying one of the second line antiandrogens, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or any of them, or taxotere, uh, or well, well, taxotere is a way. It's a way of stretching. And not overlapping toxicities. Well, you know, I, I don't think that you want to be allowing your testosterone to recover whilst you're doing chemo. I mean, I think those two things seem to combine pretty well. And, and most of the time, they want you doing, um, they want your testosterone low when you're taking the second line antiandrogens, because those are antiandrogens. They're not good. Those drugs don't don't curtail your um, testosterone. The only drug that stops your testosterone is the LHRH drug. Wouldn't be going off of Lupron uh, in order to get my testosterone back, but to provide an a safer opportunity to front load one of the other treatment drugs. Yeah, but the other treatment drugs have got a lot more work to do if there's a lot of testosterone in them. And your androgen receptors are still are still alive. They've got to I work so much harder if the testosterone level is, say, 500 or 500 versus gastrin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's let's say I do Lupron and Gastrix for a year. My testosterone's pretty much gone. It's going to take... As you were suggesting, it might take two years for it to come back. Mm -hmm. 
well, in the first six months, I could be on tax a tier. Okay. Or something okay. else. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. while it's still hormone sensitive, and, and we know we know now it's going to be a lot more effective, thirty by like thirty three percent more effective for lifespan than if I waited until I was castrate resistant. Um, uh, why not? But then why not do it up front? See, here, here's the issue. No, nothing that you say is is wrong. We don't know if it's right or it's wrong. We have to test this. Nobody's done a trial where they've taken somebody off of the LHRH and then followed it, and then followed it with a, somebody who's meta, is, 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 is um, metastatic. We don't know if we cut the LHRH and then start the chemo, if that works better than starting it at the beginning. You have a theory that it may do. You've just got to justify that to your doctor and try it. But what we do know is if you give it up front per the Stampede trial, um, per the Latitude trial, seems to work pretty good. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, per the Stampede trial. If we give the, give the chemo up front with somebody who is in bone, has bone mets, so we give it at the same time as the LHR, it works pretty good. We don't know if your theory works or not, but it may do. Tell me something. Where are you? Um, where do you stand with your insurance? Um, well, I applied a few days back, just just before the deadline Good. for a supplemental plan G. Good. Okay. Uh, with the intention of moving over to UCSF. Okay. okay. And away from Kaiser. Okay. And you haven't heard yet. Uh, I, I haven't. This has not been confirmed for me yet. Okay. And did they indicate whether you would be on that the lower level premium or the tier two premium? Yeah, I'm sorry, say that again. Did they indicate whether you would be on the lower premium or the tier two premium? Um, I don't know about the tiers of the premium. Okay. But uh, I can tell you what the price is. Well, there, 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 are, there, is, there are two prices on all of these plans. There's the lower price, which I suspect would be somewhere around 200 to $250 a month in, in Marin or in, in uh, Contra Costa. And then there is a premium price because they can't turn you down, but they can charge you more. And that's a couple of hundred dollars more a month. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, um, I think I was around 200. And they, you know, they came, the applications uh, came with a reservation that they, uh, and I won't know whether I'm accepted or, or what the price is going to be until they get back to me. Right. So don't be surprised if they do accept you, but your premium turns out to be around 400 a month. Okay, thanks for the warning on that. Okay, if you go, if you look at the, if you go to the website where the plans are out, uh, are laid out, and you see the prices, in the box at the bottom, there's a li another little number that will say tier two number, and that's what the higher price is. Okay, good. Okay. Good to know. But it still may pay you to, be, to pay more to get yourself over to, you know, if it costs you an extra 2,500 bucks a year over what you're paying and you have access to it to doctors anywhere in the country, you may prefer that. Okay. Well, so, you know, if you had to vote on it, I mean, if you had to make a decision, each of you for yourselves right now, between the two things being offered, Cytiga and Taxotier, to go with Lupron, what would you go with? Len stepped away. Oh, he's back. Len, what would you go with? Well, um, and this is just me. I'm not a big fan of uh, Taxotere or any chemo. So I would go with the uh, Zytiga. But um, that doesn't mean it's the right choice for you by any means. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Did I make a comment about Zotil? This is Tom Vincent. Uh, I, I was uh, on Lupron and Casadex, and my PSA was not under control. It wouldn't get lower than, say, maybe an 8, and it would bounce up to a 13 and down to a 6, but usually higher than 6. I, I finally switched over to Zytiga. It knocked it down below zero, and it's kept it there. Now, that's me. Everybody's different, but I'm pretty happy with the results of the Zytiga. And it doesn't give you a whole lot to me, a lot of side effects. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else? Dennis, what would you do? Before we go on, some someone is echoing very badly here. It's, I think it's I narrowed it down to either uh, it's Rick art. or Art. Yeah, it is Art, and it's coming from his mic. I think we just have to live with it, Jay. I'm turning my mic off right now, except for when I talk. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I was trying to mute you and watching your mouth and unmuting you when you started talking, but <laughs> I don't know how much that helped. Right. Um, Dennis, what what would you choose? Well, I, I'm right at this moment with the latest data, and the reason I would choose this way is from my oncologist that I have a lot of respect for. Uh, I was initially treated over a year ago with Dostaxel and uh, Firmagon to start, switched over from Firmagon to Lupron, but he, he was very adamant about the effect of doing both of those at the same time. And then I've had a progression here after about a year and a half, and they did some more scans uh, and conf confirmed that from the metastasis. Uh, so they're going after the other androgens uh, that are being produced because just going after the, the testicles, uh, and uh, testosterone that's produced is, is not enough for these things. As Rick has said, they, they continue to morph. They're producing their own enzymes and they're converting that stuff into fuel for themselves. And so Zytiga came up and as a recommendation from uh, the tumor board at Mayo for me uh, as the second line treatment, Zytiga with prednisone. And I take, uh, it's a thousand milligrams a day, Zytiga, and a uh, prednisone. I take two and a half milligrams twice a day with pre prednisone. And that's primarily to replace or take the place of some of the essential androgens that are needed by other parts of your body, is the way I understand it. And I think I've, I've also gotten a side benefit of a good benefit from the prednisone of taking away a lot of my other aches and pains and stiffness and uh, things that I really was really plaguing me. If I'd sit for very long in, in a car or a dining table or anywhere just about, or in the morning when I try to get out of bed, I basically couldn't move my legs. I felt like two telephone poles. And that has gone away as quickly as I, I just couldn't believe it. I thought it was just something I was going to have to live with for the, for the duration. Uh, but that, that was a very positive side effect. I feel a lot better. Uh, I'm 72 years old. I play 18 holes twice a week. Uh, a lot of other activities I'm involved in. But for me, uh, the Zytiga has been the, the biggest help. The Zytiga with the prednisone. Uh, but I guess, you know, we're all different. It depends where you're at. I've had, you know, multiple metastases up the, the spine and so forth uh, in both femurs. And uh, I think like Rick says, I mean, just you try to find wherever's going to work for you to kind of slow this thing down. That's all we're, we're hoping for at this point in time. And hopefully by the time maybe if I get another progression, uh, there'll be some new drugs out there that'll that'll work for me. But I I am now my PSA is at 0.3, uh, which is lower than it was after my dose taxol and uh, Lupron treatment that got me down to 0.66. Uh, then it went up again. You know, as I said, I had this progression. It took me up. I was about 3.1, I think it was, and uh, had the scans done. I think any of this, though, is the, the need to continue to 
uh, whatever treatment you're on is, is getting all the proper blood work to ensure that you're not having adverse impacts from whatever it is. And along with the PSA monitoring uh, and the uh, occasional scans that they might need to do. That's, that's kind of my take on art. Did anybody throw in the possibility of revenge? Well, the, the, uh, issue, the issue with Prevenge, I mean, Prevenge is a great, uh, I, I happen to be a believer in Prevenge, and I think it's um, an excellent drug, but it's only available to most people once you're castrate resistant. So once you're castrate resistant and you've seen three successive increases in your PSA, you can get Prevenge. And what what my uh, what my doctor had me do is stop taking Casadex for about a month, right? And get a couple PSA tests. He knew my PSA would go through the roof when I stopped taking right. Casadex. Right. right, it did, and I qualified. Right, and you can be manipulated, but but you know, fortunately for <clears throat> us at this point in time, he hasn't been on the ADC long enough to get him qualified for the Provenge. And so it's, it's, it, it is something that as soon as he becomes suffering resistant, and we hope that's going to be a long time away, he should do as soon as he can, but, 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 but not right now. Ah, the other thing I just wanted to mention, because I'm just looking at my cheat sheet here from when I read Stampede and I read Latitude. You know, one thing that neither of those trials did was um, they, they never used overall survival or um, disease-specific survival as measuring points. So while we know from Charted and some of the other stampede arms that um, that, ke that, that uh, uh, chemo adds 13 to 22 months to overall survival, and we know from the original Zytiga trials that it added four months for people, although those people were pretty sick when they started it, Neither stampede nor latitude really indicates to us um, how much they add. We just know they're effective, and we know they're effective even for people that are have hormone sensitive disease. But we don't know. We don't know by how much. We know that it delayed um, radiographic free progression. That was one of their measurement points. And so one of the things that's always difficult with these trials and making these decisions is comparing apples to apples because there are so many different um, measurements that they can take. And we have to make sure we're, 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 we're talking apples to apples. And at the end of the day, it seems to me that you, you need a really smart um, genito urinary medical oncologist that you trust and you get guided by them. And in, essentially, that's what that discussion, I mean, if you listen to the discussion with with, um, with uh, Morgans and Sweeney and Ryan, I mean, to me, that was a very enlightening discussion. The one with, Sweeney, with, with, with Ryan and, and Morgans was also very good, but the one with the three of them was really interesting because they were saying to each other, you know, well, when would you give a guy chemo first? When would you give a guy Zytiga first? And what they all said, I think, this was what I took from it, and I could be wrong, is, you know, let's, if we could do it, let's give the chemo first. But if there's any pushback from the man because he's resistant to chemo, like Len is, for example, then just give him the Zytiga because we may, it may be just as good. We don't really know. You can switch your mic on now. Okay, I'm back on. There you go. Well, I agree with you completely about one, about the importance of having a, a oncologist that's in the know and that can advise me. Mm -hmm. um, I hope to find find one of those at UCSF sometime early next year. Okay. Um, we'll we'll get you set up there. Don't worry about that. <laughs> If you've got access, we'll find you the we'll find you who you want. Okay, I want to just before before I hand it over, I want to double back to that point about antiandrogens causing proliferation increase in some men. Mm -hmm. um, 
apparently that can be avoided by uh, adding Avogadro. Avogadro. Yes. Well, you know, I I don't know who's saying that, but I would like to look at that pretty carefully because it can also exacerbate and accelerate the um, the speed at which the cancer morphs. Uh, that was Snuffy Myers at the last Prostate Cancer Research Institute exactly. symposium in LA. Exactly. And that's the whole issue with Snuffy. Snuffy throws everything out of it up front, and Snuffy's always been open to the to the criticism that his patients um, their disease morphs much quicker. And, and you know, I I I, I hear you. Well, there's, it's, it's also being said, shoot, I don't have, I can't make the attribution, but this was from a study. Um, so I'll see what I can come up with on that. Okay, and because I, that. We've, we've only got about 10 minutes left. I want to, I, I really wanted to touch base with Dennis and I wanted to touch base with, 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 with Tom. Um, just very quickly, Len. Talk to Tom about androgen ADT holidays because that was what um, he raised early on before you got on the line. I said, I hope Len joins us because I know that you have given a lot of thought and have experienced ADT vacations. You with us, Len? We can't hear you. I did. I didn't Sorry, mute you, Len. I, yeah, I forgot I was muted. <clears throat> um, yeah, I have taken, excuse me, <clears throat> two uh, ADT vacations. <clears throat> the first time was before I had uh, radiation therapy, and uh, that lasted seven months. That lasted seven months and my PSA rose rapidly. <clears throat> so I was put back on ADT. Now for me, uh, it was a good seven months. My testosterone rose to 700 or something. Uh, I felt stronger, uh, more energetic, and to me it was worth it. I went back on ADT and the PSA started dropping again. I had radiation therapy and um, went on a second break uh, drug holiday from ADT. And uh, I've been on that holiday since April of this year. And in that time, uh, my PSA has risen from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. So it's definitely coming up, but not nearly as rapidly as uh, pre-radiation days when it went uh, from 0.2 to almost 11. Um, so I'm sorry, Rick, what was the question? Well, I think that um, Tom's having a tough time with the ADT. He's wondering whether he should go on a um, ADT um, vacation. He's also having trouble um, convincing his medical team that debulking the tumor might be an option. Does he uh, does he have bone metastases or is it just locally advanced? Tom, uh, no bo no bones. No. It's it's in the lymph node. Yeah. Okay. You're in the same situation as me. Um, well, you know, it's your decision, really. You don't have to get permission from your oncologist. Uh, there's no evidence, one way or another, that it will prolong your survival or shorten your survival. So it's a quality of life decision. Now, if you go on a ADT holiday and your testosterone rises, um, you'll feel great and uh, you'll think it was worth it as it was with me. However, there are some guys who go on ADT holiday and their testosterone simply doesn't rise or it doesn't rise very much and they don't really feel much better 
but I continue to have all the symptoms as though they were on ADT. Uh, so you won't know that until you actually do it. Len, what I have found is uh, like when the Casadex wasn't working well for me or stopped working or when they took me off it to get my PSA to come up so that I could get Prevenge, I almost feel it right away when my PSA is coming up before I even get a test. I start to feel lousy. I can feel myself getting sick when my PSA goes up. So I don't know if that would be a good option to get my testosterone up or get my PSA up also. There's, yeah. probably, there's probably no way out. I'll probably have to stay on the loop run. I just hate it. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you're the type of person who's going to start panicking when you see your PSA rise, then uh, it's not a good idea. And, and it's, uh, you know, no doubt it will go up. Um, I don't mind seeing it rise. That's just me. Yeah, that, that would probably scare me if I saw the PSA yeah. going up. I understand. Because it was scaring me when I couldn't get the PSA to go down. <laughs> and I got real happy when I went on Zytiga and it went down and stayed down. Then I started to play. I started to play around with the Zytiga because, uh, you know, they tell you to take it uh, on an empty stomach, you know, like mm -hmm. two hours away from a meal, either before or after. And there was some discussion that, oh, you, you don't need to take uh, four of the pills. I think it's a thousand milligrams. You could just take 250 with food. And I, right. I tried that for just a, a month or a month and a half. And my PSA started to go up a little and I started to feel lousy and I quickly got back on the regular dosage because it scared me. And I started to feel crappy. So, yeah, I'd probably chicken out right away if I went off loop and my PSA went up. Yeah, there was a small clinical trial. I, I think it was no more than, I don't know, 20 or 30 people right. where they found that uh, taking one pill with food was as good as four without food. Um, and there was, uh, as I recall, no, no difference. <laughs> I asked, I asked my, on, I asked my oncologist before I did it and I don't know him that well. I haven't been with him all that long. And he said, yeah, go ahead and do that if you want. <laughs> and he let yeah. me do it and he wasn't right. surprised to find out I stopped it. Um, what about this issue? I mean, Tom indicated that his medical team is not that receptive to radiation. Um, what thoughts do you have with respect to that, Len? Yeah, Len, every, every time I ask about any kind of radiation, they all just say, uh, oh, the horse is out of the barn, it's in your lymph nodes, forget about it, you don't qualify, it won't help you at all. And when, when was the last time you had that discussion? Uh, just about a month ago when I was down there. I ask about the debulking the tumor with radiation. No, no, that's not for you. You're in the lymph nodes, you know, you're metastasized. Well, what, what I had, Tom, was a full pelvic girdle radiation. So they zap the, uh, the prostate, the seminal vesicles and lymph nodes in the pelvic area. Uh, that's where my positive lymph nodes were. They were in the pelvic area. I don't know if yours are outside of that area. Yeah, some of mine are beyond that. Oh, okay. So maybe that's why they were saying that. Nevertheless, um, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's worth uh, debulking, in my opinion. It seemed to do, seemed to be a good choice for me. And then we've had, and then we've had Tom um, Ken Anderson, who sees uh, Paul Corn at MD Anderson. I, in my opinion, one of the very best GU medonks. And we've also had um, Steve Bourne, and uh, they have debulked um, the primary. And in in Ken's case, they also. Um, he also had pelvic girdle radiation, and both those guys have, have got um, mets to the bone and have done chemotherapy. So, you know, I, 
my suggestion would be to to tell um, Gainersman to recommend to Gainersman have a conversation with Paul Korn at MD Anderson about what he thinks about Vulcan. Okay. And, and come back to us. You know, we'll, we'll do, the the thing is that there isn't a lot. When I say there isn't a lot of um, evidence, that there's some evidence for surgery that's been provided by Mayo and that's been provided by Memorial Sloan Kettering. But it just seems like more and more now, um, a lot of the doctors are saying, okay, maybe we should debulk, either through surgery or through radiation, because I just see it happening more often. And, um, you know, and, and, and for example, Ken Anderson, and, and that's why I would say let Gainesman talk to somebody like Paul Korn, who has a, a great reputation. Yeah, when, when I threw it out to Gynasman and used the term tumor debulking, it, I don't think he was familiar with that term. And I, I could just tell by the look on his face, and I said, are you aware of this concept? And he said, well, I know what debulking means. And I mean, of course, anybody with the size, you know, the idea of bulk knows what debulking means. But I don't think he was really familiar with the whole concept. Well, when you're ready, let us know, and maybe we can at least refer you to the um, to the Memorial Sloan Kettering study. But that was a surgical study rather than radiation, which I, I wouldn't do. But I mean, we talked. You know, the only reason not to do it would be concern for side effects of whatever treatment you had, whether it's radiation or surgery. Uh, Otherwise, of course, uh, why should you leave the cancer in place? <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's my concern is you've got this. I just look at it as a, a great cancer generator inside you completely unmolested. And you're just uh, treating the effects of it with the androgen, knocking down the androgens, but uh, leaving that thing alone. That's always in the back of my mind is, hey, let's hit this thing with something. Yeah, it's just a very, I had a, it's Larry Fish. Hi, guys. So, so today I had this conversation with uh, Karen Audio at Sloan. The, um, I was asking her about this idea of debulking the, the, the um, prostate. And then I asked her, uh, can they tell when you have, when you start to have progression, what, where the progression is coming from? Is it coming from the prostate, the lymph? Is it, she said sometimes it's coming from the prostate, and sometimes it's coming from the bone. And then, then we drifted away. But this was a very interesting idea because if you start to have progression and then you could get an idea where that progression is coming from, that might be a strong impetus to debulk the primary. Mm -hmm. We didn't finish that discussion. With yeah, that and, and you know, there's, I, I read a paper not so long ago that the nature of the prostate cells that come from the primary are actually more aggressive, dangerous than the cells that come from the metastasis. The metastasis. It's a different type of cell. And, and I'm getting above my pay grade at that point, so I need help. But um, that's what was the that was the gist of the paper. Um, you know, I'd like to. Hopefully, we can come back to this. And Tom, we'll give you more time next week or, or the week after, as soon as you come back, because we, we need to talk about this some more. But the witching hour has come. I didn't touch base with Dennis. Um, Dennis, was there anything urgent that you wanted to talk about tonight? No, no, that's okay, Rick. Go ahead. Okay. I don't need. Thanks, and and Larry, I, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you, but we're um, I didn't see you till late, and I'd like to know what Car uh, Karen Audio can can you update us um, in the next session next Monday? Sure. I, uh, there's nothing really much to say. We're we're gonna I'm gonna stay in limbo for another month before we make a decision. My PSA didn't go up very much, so. There's no reason to, we could wait for a month before I will talk. Well, you can talk before a month. We'll allow that. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
I, I'm sure I will. But anyway, thanks a lot. What was your What was your PSA? Just so I can make a note. Well, you know, it went. I stopped cash at X three four months ago, and it came down. It came down to point one zero. And then it went up to 0.15, and now, strangely, it's at 0.13. It came down a little bit. So I'm stalling a month before we do scans and see what uh, we're looking at next. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's just a normal variation. So, all right. Um, well, gents, we're, um, we're over the top just by a couple of minutes. But, again, from, you know, from, from being a small group, we hit on some – Really great stuff tonight. I mean, the, you know, the discussion about the emotional impact of the LHRH drugs, the sequencing with with art. Um, this last discussion <laughs> discussion on ADT and debulking. Um, it was um, it was a good conversation, and um, I will be posting it if you want to listen to it again. Uh, we will be back. Uh, in your living rooms um, on the 18th. Hopefully everybody will receive the email. Please make sure that my email address is whitelisted so I, I don't get thrown into spam. Um, otherwise you won't see me or you'll have to troll through your spam to, to find, find it. I, I'm wondering if that's the problem for you, Len. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna check my spam folder. Okay. All right, um, so we'll talk to you all in six days. Oh, and happy Hanukkah to anybody that's celebrating it's first first night. I'm going to go light my candle. Okay. Okay, thanks for the attention. Okay, pleasure. Bye, everybody. Good luck, Good luck everybody. Bye. Good night. Great, you want me to hold on? Oh, yeah. Um, so Len, I heard that you couldn't, you didn't see our notice this week. Uh, of this, of tonight's broadcast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't see that and I didn't see, um, your edits to, uh, the appeal, end of your appeal. So maybe some, I don't know, are you using a different email address suddenly that it might no. go to spam? No. Okay. I'll, I checked to see if I accidentally deleted it, and I hadn't. So the only other possibility is the spam. I'm not sure. So I sent I resent you the edits. Okay. And you'll see that you were copied, because I did a reply all, and you'll see that you were copied there. So it it just didn't get to you, or it okay. got into spam. And it's weird that you didn't get. It's weird that you didn't get, and and I I'm pretty sure on the um, on the email. Let me just look here. Um, on the email, the advance notice email, you were um, where's it gone here? Let me have a look here. Um, yeah, on the advance notice email, you were you were in the CC line. I'm looking at it. Yeah, yeah, I believe you. Um, I'm, right I'm now, forwarding I'm that. I'm forwarding it to you again. Um, okay. I'm looking at my spam folder, and I don't see anything from you there. So it remains a mystery for the moment. Yeah, I don't know. Did you? We'll sort it out. Did you get my? Did you get the second email I sent to you about an hour, about two hours ago? Oh, let me look for that. Um, the last email I got from you was with the title "Mail Care." Uh, oh, yeah, I also got an email from you prior to that at five fifty. Yeah. It's a donation reminder. Yeah, that's the that that has the edits in it, so you did get it. Yeah. Okay. All right, just one of those. And I just sent you. The, I just sent you the uh, the notice again. So I don't know what happens. I I have a belief that ten percent of all email never reaches its destination. 
I need. Yeah, yeah. It, it happens to me with other people that I uh, email regularly. Yeah. I get almost all of them, but once in a while, somehow I'm I'm not. Uh, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to tell you that I this uh, weekend, starting Sunday, I will be down in Reston, Virginia, for the CDMRP. I know. Meeting, which means which means uh, I'll be there the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So uh, so even though my Italian class is finished, I, I can't join the call on Monday because I'll be down in Virginia. OK, how's your homework going? Oh, I finished all the protocols or 15 protocols I had to review and critique. And I, I did that. So I'm, I'm done with that. Good. Uh, lots of interesting research, you know, there approaches targeting prostate cancer stem cells, um, uh, P10 loss, uh, mm. Tempress 2 ERG, which is very common, you know, all kinds of uh, mutations. So it's mm. pharmacy research, of course, it, it doesn't uh, pan out for another five years or yeah, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it's successful, yeah. but anyway. Have you heard anything about this, um, These the difference in these the nature of the cells between the primary and the metastasized cells? Well, yeah, I mean, several months ago, I don't remember exactly when, there was that paper coming out of um, Fred Hutchinson, right, where they, they were saying that the met metastatic cells were more uh, homogeneous than right. the primary, right. which was very heterogeneous. Right. Um, other than that, no, I'm not sure I've, I've heard anything since then. Yeah, no, I read something recently, like within the last three months, about how the the primary tumor cells are more potent than the um, than the metastasized ones. Uh, well, I wonder if it's kind of a, a variation of that same study I just mentioned, where it would be an advantage, right? If the metastatic cells are mostly homogeneous, yeah, you know, you know what to attack. If they're yeah. heterogeneous in the prostate, you don't know what you're yeah. targeting. It could be many possibilities there. Yeah. yeah, so it makes sense. So I need to uh, get myself some dinner. Okay, and go. It's late here for me, and uh, happy Hanukkah to you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'll. I'll uh, I'll keep in touch and let you know how things went in Virginia. Yeah. Okay. What about you? Are you going to be doing any traveling? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a good time of year to be traveling. I don't want to travel anywhere. Thank you right now. We've got we've got snow on the ground here from when was it a couple of days ago, but not much, just a few inches. Uh, and they tell me that it's going to be upper 40s or low 50s in Virginia by the Sunday. So. No snow there. That should be good. Hey, Len, how, how does it feel to have snow on the ground and you don't have to shovel your driveway? It's wonderful, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Sent out an email to my sisters entitled, Let It Snow. I don't give a damn. <laughs> I don't have to clean it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's nice. Okay. All, All right. right. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, be well. Bye. Oh.